So hello, my name is John Baldwin, and I'm going to be talking today about uh, changes that have been made over the past, uh, the recent years, uh, refining FreeBSD's end kernel crypto framework. Get my clicker to happily work. Cool. All right, so to start with, uh, first I'm going to start off by talking about what is the kernel crypto framework inside of FreeBSD. Uh, I'll give a brief history talking about kind of how the crypto came, framework was first came to be in FreeBSD, how it was imported, and some changes that were made over uh, the, the years leading up to a couple of years ago. Then I'm going to spend some time talking specifically about uh, changes mostly in FreeBSD 13 uh, that I made, but also some changes that some other folks have made uh, both a little bit before that and after that. And then lastly, I'm going to conclude by talking a little bit about some additional changes that could be made in the future that I think would still help improve the framework. So what is this framework, which I'm going to call OCF. That's kind of what we call it over in FreeBSD land. Um, OCF is an interface around crypto drivers. It's kind of the glue that allows uh, consumers in the kernel things that need cryptography like IPsec or Jelly for disk encryption to request uh, encryption operations from device drivers. Um, originally, OCF came from OpenBSD, and there it was called the OpenBSD Crypto Framework. Over time, the, 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 the framework in FreeBSD has diverged, um, and we haven't necessarily pulled in updates from OpenBSD, and I'm not honestly sure how OpenBSD's development has gone, but I know FreeBSD's has changed. So now, just to kind of avoid confusion, we call it the Open Crypto Framework. It also happens to be in Sys Open Crypto in the kernel, so that's also, I think, why the acronym kind of is the second one. Um, OCF supports primarily symmetric operations. So symmetric operations in cryptography would be things like encrypting or decrypting a buffer, um, but also authentication op um, operations, uh, things like generating a MAC or verifying if a MAC is correct. Um, OCF is, is purpose, what it's aimed at and intended to be used for, are in kernel use cases. So things like IPsec, uh, more recently kernel TLS offload, but also disk encryption like Jelly. Um, Technically, when thinking about what parts of the code make up OCF inside of the kernel, uh, library implementations that are direct software implementations of certain algorithms aren't really necessarily part of OCF because they can be used by other parts of the kernel. Uh, but OCF does have software drivers that can use those APIs. So things like um, the low level API for generating a SHA hash that has an init routine and update to update with blocks and final to get the final digest back out. Those aren't necessarily part of OCF in terms of they're not part of the framework, uh, but there is a software driver that this kind of in OCF that does make use of those libraries and those kind of library APIs. So now I want to talk a little bit about the history of OCF, how it came into FreeBSD and how it kind of progressed up to the point of FreeBSD 11 before I started looking at it. So the original version of OCF came from OpenBSD. It was ported by Sam Leffler into FreeBSD 5.0. This version was really focused on IPsec as its main consumer. And that's why Sam brought it over, was to support a, a, a newer, different IPsec stack, um, separate from the, com like the common IPsec stack that had been in FreeBSD before. Um, it also supports uh, that OCF at this time supported a user land interface via character device dev crypto that allowed user land to um, submit requests for cryptographic operations. It also supported asymmetric operations that can be useful for public key cryptography like RSA. Um, uh, the things that would support are uh, certain math operations like Chinese remainder theorem and some others. And those were only, those weren't used in the kernel, but they were available via uh, actual on dev crypto. At the time OCF was imported, it supported ciphers that were contemporary and kind of used by IPsec at the time, um, things like uh, DES and CBC mode, um, and digest like MT5 and SHA-1. It also supported combined or what it would sometimes call fused operations uh, that are used by IP, some IPsec cipher suites. Uh, the ones that IPsec uses are a combination called encrypt then authenticate, uh, which means that when you are processing a, a, an IP packet, uh, you first encrypt the payload part and then you run your digest like MD5 or SHA over both some unauthenticated part of the data um, that goes in the clear as well as the encrypted payload. Um, several years later, um, around FreeBSD 11, uh, support for ASGCM was added. 
um, by John Mark Gurney. ASGCM is a different kind of algorithm compared to the previous kind of E to A combination. Um, it's an algorithm that's called an uh, authenticated encryption with associated data algorithm. It's kind of similar to ETA, but by definition, as opposed to you're gluing two algorithms together in some combination, um, an AE80 algorithm defines specifically how you glue things together in, in one specific type of combination, um, as opposed to leaving the combination up to the client to define different types of modes. Uh, it's also true that OpenSSL has shipped an engine in the past that will work with DevCrypto. Uh, but one of the things that happened in OpenSSL's kind of world is they um, changed a bunch of stuff for OpenSSL 1.1. And the result of one of those things is they rewrote the engine that uses DevCrypto from scratch. And the person, when they rewrote that, or the authors when they rewrote that, decided to drop support for trying to offload asymmetric operations to DevCrypto. They have a comment in there about the fact that the interface seems really undocumented and kind of hard to them if they weren't sure how to use it. So what did I work on kind of and what was my the reason that I started looking at OCF uh, a couple of years ago? Um, well, the, the one of the main motivations was that I was working on porting two different crypto drivers from Linux to FreeBSD in the kind of 12 current time frame as part of the kind of some for some of my clients. Um, and I'd also have been working more recently with Netflix on helping them upstream their kernel TLS framework into upstream FreeBSD. And Netflix had worked on KTLS for quite a while before we got to the point of upstreaming. And they had experimented with OCF early on. And they had found that trying to use OCF to deal with encrypting TLS records didn't perform very well. So they ended up writing their kind of their own homegrown kind of abstract interface that, can, that supported multiple software backends to deal with encrypting. And I kind of wanted to get to a place where uh, we would be able to use OCF. In particular, um, a use case I had is I wanted to be able to use at least one of these two crypto drivers that I had been porting along with KTLS to handle the encryption. So when I came to OCF, I came to look at it kind of the way that OCF shipped in, in FreeBSD 11. So I want to talk a little bit about what that looked like at the time, what it was like to kind of port a driver OCF at the time. Um, so one of the first things that stuck out to me is the way um, I should define, I guess, what a session is. A session in OCF, this is kind of a typical language, I guess, to talk about um, in crypto software. A session is kind of um, a handle, you might think, or a way to say that the parameters that you're going to use to encrypt several chunks of data. So, for example, a socket that's using TLS. Uh, there would be a session that would describe how you're going to encrypt all the TLS records that are going in a given direction on a TLS socket. Um, and you might have a session that describes how you're going to decrypt the records that you receive. Um, with IPsec, um, a given entry in your SA database that defines a key uh, or a kind of a, a session key, that might be a, a single session that you, would just, that you would manage. So a session in OCF and FreeBSD 11 the way we would, you would kind of build this if you're a consumer like IPsec and the way as a driver you would find out about a session is you had a linked list of structures, um, separate ones for encryption and auth. Um, and there was an arbitrary linked list that could be of arbitrary length. When you got a request to actually encrypt or decrypt a buffer, um, one of the things that request did include as well was a linked list of these little descriptor structures that would define the regions of the data buffer that you were going to encrypt or the region of the data buffer that you were going to um, hash to generate a map. So in all the drivers at the time, one of the things you had to do often that was kind of boilerplate across the drivers is you would start off in your when you're creating a session or when you're processing an operation, you have to go walk this linked list just to figure out to make sure that you didn't have some configuration you didn't support. Like in theory, you could create an operation that wanted to encrypt data and then Mac it and then encrypt it again or something, maybe with a different algorithm or the same algorithm or, or something bizarre like that. Um, and so a driver had to check to make sure that most drivers didn't support that. They had to walk the list to make sure you didn't specify more than one cipher or you didn't specify more than one authenticator. Then once they kind of done that first pass and figured out, well, this one is actually the one about my cipher and this is the one about my authenticator, then they would actually perform uh, specific checks on the cipher thing and the off side. Um, when uh, AEAD support for ASGCM was brought into OCF, um, it did work and it was kind of consistent with how OCF worked at the time. Um, but some of the ways it was integrated were not necessarily intuitive, um, at least to me. Um, for example, 
um, an AE80 algorithm by definition, while it includes both kind of privacy, it encrypts data and authentication, it provides a Mac, um, it's a single unified algorithm. So there's a single key that you're supposed to use. But because of the way OCF worked uh, and because of the way the descriptors worked and so forth, AD80 algorithms had to be split up into two halves. And so there were separate kind of algorithm constants for the cipher half of an AD algorithm and the authentication half. Um, this meant that, for example, when you're creating the session or when you're creating operations, if you're using uh, different keys for every request, you had to make sure and specify the same key in two different places. And then as a driver, you had to check to make sure that they got the same key in both places. And, and if for some reason a user gave you different keys for different sides, you should reject it. Um, and actually, I one used one thing that popped up recently is someone opened a bug because uh, because of some confusion around this. I think on FreeBSD 11 still, um, you can do this weird combination where you configure an IPsec tunnel as set key that tries to use ASGCM for encryption, but then some some other thing like SHA for the hash, and it does some very non-standard thing um, where it's really using AES counter with like the wrong IV. And it does something and it'll work between two FreeBSD boxes, but it's, it's broken. You can't do the configuration in 13. That's what the bug was about. And, but the resolution of the bug is, well, actually, we allowed you to do something very non-standard. And it, it came out of this confusion for how we split up the two sides. Um, another unique thing about the way we handled A80 algorithms in OCF and 11 was with E to A, um, you would have the authentication descriptor would describe the region of the packet or the buffer that you're going to hash, like the whole thing, which normally included um, some extra data that's called AAD, that's the data that you're not encrypting, but is still data you want to protect that's in the clear, um, as well as your payload. And you would, you're going to hash the whole thing. So the, the auth descriptor for ETA would describe the whole thing. With AAD, um, with, or rather with AAD algorithms, it's really important that you kind of more clearly distinguish AA data or AAD data from your payload. Uh, there's details with how there's extra things we feed into the Mac side that have to know the specific lengths of the two regions and so forth. So for AAD, what happened was the auth descriptor, instead of spanning everything you were going to authenticate, it just spanned AAD and you had to know um, in your driver or your, or your, well, your driver implementation um, that for this, these type of algorithms, you implicitly also are going to send the encryption side to your, your Mac part of your algorithm. And so it didn't quite match how E to A worked. Um, another difference, um, and this was kind of much better in uh, A80, is that uh, when you're doing a decryption operation, um, A80 algorithms, for, specifically for ASGCM, the drivers are responsible for verifying when you're decrypting a buffer uh, that the tag supplied with the Mac as part of your input buffer for decryption, you're supposed to check and verify that and fail the request um, in the driver and report that failure up to the consumer. The way E to A had been implemented in OCF was that uh, the drivers were always responsible for computing and overriding the Mac based on whatever kind of data they had received, which meant that you had to do some odd things. For example, in IPsec, IPsec had to, when dealing with decrypting a packet received with E to A, uh, it had to explicitly allocate a little side buffer and copy off the Mac, then send it to OCF, and allow OCF to regenerate the Mac based on what it um, decrypted, and then explicitly compare them inside of IPsec. Well, it turns out that like common modern hardware assumes that it's going to do more, uh, that it's going to do the verification itself. So for example, in modern drivers, I then had to um, basically go and do almost the reverse of that inside the driver where I would copy off the Mac of the received packet um, and kind of ignore if the driver failed it or not, and then copy the Mac back, <laughs> um, or effectively copy the Mac back, or kind of copy a generated one on top. It was it was a bizarre thing I had to do as a workaround to kind of make it work with what um, OCF worked at the time. And really, the design, what the hardware expects, and what is really best practice with ETA is you should check the Mac first, and if that fails, don't even bother decrypting the data. And so it really should belong in the driver. Another thing that was um, a bit unusual in OCF and 11 was how device drivers and consumers were expected to work with IVs. Um, so IVs are a, a, like an input into your cipher. It's got to get you started. Um, and there were uh, three ways effectively, or two ways that an IV could be stored, but because of some unique behavior, it ended up being a kind of tri-state. So in particular, uh, your IV could be part of your input data buffer, which it could be, for example, in certain IPsec um, cases. 
And then even some, some TLS cases, kind of, well, in some TLS cipher suites, it's in line as part of your kind of actual packet on the wire. Um, but in some cases, your IV is not, or maybe part of it's on the wire and part of it's not. And so you need the ability to put your IV kind of in a little side buffer that's part of the request, but not part of the actual data buffer that's going to be part of a network packet, for example. And so OCF supported both of those, but then it had a weird quirk for the case that the IV was not in a side buffer, but the IV was in the packet, which said that you could request that for encryption, this doesn't make sense for decryption, but for encryption, you could set a flag, or maybe you had to not set a flag. It was really not clear. Um, that's how the interface worked. But effectively, there was a third mode where the device driver was responsible for journeying a random number and sticking it in uh, the packet or in the buffer to be the IV. Uh, and I assume that this was there because it was envisioned that there was some hardware, or maybe some hardware at one point did exist, that would, as the process of encrypting the packet would do this step for you. It had its own little um, PRNG on the card, and that would generate a random number and stick it for you. But none of the driver, drivers in the tree did this. Every single driver in the tree, though, did duplicate the same exact code to call arc for random to ask the kernel for random value to stick in the buffer. Um, so that we <laughs> duplicated all this code and all these drivers, and it, it for a use case, it didn't seem to exist. Another kind of interesting quirk, um, the way that the handle that was kind of used to name a crypto session that was handed back to consumers like IPsec, and then used to pass down to drivers to tell them what session they were operating on um, when they're processing request uh, were simple integers. Um, and effectively, you could think of them like a file descriptor would be in Unix. So a value like zero, one, or two, or so forth. Um, and this had some interesting consequences. Um, it meant that when drivers were going to actually do an operation where they're going to encrypt a buffer or decrypt a buffer, they had to take that integer and turn around and map it into their own kind of private pointer. And I guess I should back up a little bit to say that one of the things as a crypto device driver you often have to do is you have to maintain some state that's private to your driver and specific to your driver about each session. Um, maybe you have cached certain bits of kind of the kind of descriptor you're going to build that's, that's private to your hardware. Um, so you have a template descriptor you're going to be able to kind of modify for each request and copy out, for example. Well, you're going to want to store that in your own kind of driver-sized per-session data buffer. Um, and so you need a way to find that, and you would use this ID to find it. Um, the other thing, uh, well, yes, uh, it's also true that the drivers are actually responsible for allocating and maintaining these IDs. It wasn't done by the framework. Um, so the way this happened in practice, I mean, you can imagine less turbo ways perhaps. So what actually happened in practice is that all the drivers in the tree either used an order in loop, which is not great and doesn't scale if you're going to actually have a lot of sessions, um, for example, tens of thousands of sockets doing TLS, um, or perhaps the driver would use a table that it had to resize when it had to allocate a session ID bigger than the table it already had. Um, but because you're working with this linked list or you're, you're having to deal with races with adding and removing sessions, you have to just look up under a lock. And that's kind of sucky from a performance perspective. So given kind of the things that I'd seen, and also given um, I kind of mentioned but briefly that the two drivers I worked with, I had ported them over. I initially had started in both cases with looking at how the driver had interfaced with Linux's equivalent kind of framework for dealing with in kernel crypto, and then try to transliterate that into what the equivalent of OCF was. Um, and some of these quirks that I described, such as linked list, the things um, and kind of the way the buffer layout worked um, were different in Linux. And, and some of the ideas I think were probably better expressed in Linux. So I kind of tried to adapt and, and figure out what are some ways we can improve uh, what we do over in FreeBSC land. Um, so when I came to look at OCF and I had written uh, two different drivers, uh, my conclusion was that at least from my perspective as a driver author, I'm not worried as much about um, the client consumers like IPsec, OCF, as it stood in FreeBSD 11, felt a bit clunky and obtuse at times. Um, in some ways, it seemed overly flexible. Uh, so the linked lists, I, I've read about them in a few places, but they really did kind of make for extra complexity. They seemed to allow for um, arbitrary list of operations that you didn't need. So I mentioned before how, in theory, you could construct a session where you wanted to encrypt the data twice with a Mac in the middle or two times or something crazy like that. Um, but in practice, all the modern hardware that existed, the drivers I was working on, and the use cases that the kernel cared about, things like IPsec and TLS and also Jelly, um, they were, had more constrained requirements. They didn't need quite that level of flexibility. 
um, they either needed kind of a single operation, you're just doing encryption, or maybe you're just doing authentication, or if they had a combination, they really only needed to combine a cipher and a Mac, just one of each. Um, there was no, we didn't need an arbitrary linked list that could be unbounded. Uh, it really was much more constrained. Um, and we did care about maybe the order of how things are combined. Uh, so one of, for example, I've, I've talked about E to A because that's what uh, IPsec uses. There are other ways of combining them. Um, the early versions of TLS used a different version called Mac that encrypt, which does the Mac first of the unencrypted data and then kind of shoves it with some padding into uh, your payload and then encrypts that whole thing. Um, the other thing is that in these use cases, things like IPsec, or TLS, or Jelly, the, the way the buffers were laid out were fairly consistent. Um, you could describe them all in thinking of the fact that they generally had um, some kind of uh, possibly zero size, they didn't have it all, but, but they had some kind of unencrypted data at the front that needed to be authenticated. Um, then you might have an IV either inline or on the side. Then you had your payload and then your Mac was slapped on at the end, possibly with padding. But in general, your buffers all followed that kind of order. In particular, that was one of the things Linux's framework really assumed that the order was going to be just that. So my goal uh, was uh, trying to make OCF a bit easier to work with. Uh, so as a driver author, um, I wanted something that was less painful, um, <laughs> that was a bit easier to understand. It didn't quite have as much boilerplate code. Uh, so one of the things I would really like to do is replace, I wanted to replace the linked list in these things with flat structures so that it was kind of simpler and easier to just evaluate what mode we're in, what algorithms we're using without having to kind of figure out which things go where. Um, I also, uh, one of the things that I would, I found limiting a bit is the way, while OCF supported different types of buffers that would describe what you're going to encrypt or decrypt. For example, you could be encrypting a flat kernel buffer that's just a pointer length or an mbuff or a better mbuff chain rather for like an IPsec packet. Um, there, while there was some abstractions around it, they weren't abstracted well enough. Um, and, and drivers all had to know and check and ver and like look at this flag field to decide which type of thing it was. And that was code that was kind of duplicated in all the drivers for how you would handle um, inbus versus other things. Um, and then when I when it came to looking at uh, KTLS and trying to optimize OCF to work better for KTLS, there were some flexibility that OCF didn't provide, some different types of flexibility that, I, that KTLS really needed. Um, one of the things KTLS needed is support for separate input and output buffers. Um, OCF and 11 uh, would only modify data in place. Now, I think from reading code comments and kind of uh, reading through OpenBSD's original paper on their open crypto framework, I think OpenBSD did support this, uh, but at some point it got lost being brought over to FreeBSD. I think it was perhaps not even there when it was first imported in 5.0. Um, but for KTLS in particular, when you're, for the use case of doing send file, where you're sending the same file out different streams, um, you really, you have a different, you have a read-only kind of source that you want to pull from, and you have per connection output buffers you want to write to. Uh, and initially when I was first writing an OCF binding for KTLS, what it had to do was manually basically copy the data out of the send file page into the per socket page, and then encrypt that in place. And that's really not efficient because you're already especially with like a code processor where you're deeming the data in and out, you could already, you're already doing a copy. You might as well, you know, do one copy instead of two. Um, another thing that KTLS kind of needed uh, that was not as relevant for IPsec, although it proved more relevant for IPsec later on, uh, is support for having that, that kind of authentication only data be in the side and not in line in the packet. Um, in particular, TLS, uh, the different cipher suites for TLS like to include extra data that's not on the wire as part of the things you authenticate, such as the TLS uh, sequence number. And I wasn't necessarily aiming to try to improve performance. I mean, I, I kind of was for, for TLS by like, for example, avoiding copies, but I wasn't kind of micro optimizing for performance as much as um, I was trying to make the interface simpler and less complex. But I do think that reducing some of the complexity might help. For example, um, collapsing the linked list down to flat structures means you're not chasing pointers and you're probably not bouncing around your cache, you're hitting as many cache misses as a result. So let's talk now about what changes were made in FreeBSD over the last couple of years to kind of improve OCF, or I believe improve OCF. So the first fix I'll talk about was made in FreeBSD 12, and it wasn't by me, it was by Conrad Meyer. Uh, 
Um, and he addressed um, how, the, how crypto sessions were named, the handles that we used. He replaced the integer IDs, which were just a flat int before, uh, with an opaque type called crypto session T. Initially, this started out as an int, and it was merged that way even into FreeBSD 11 to provide some API compatibility across branches. But in 12, uh, crypto session T actually was uh, an opaque kind of type def of the internal struct that OCF was already allocating to describe a session. And this structure has things like um, the reference to what driver is being used, um, and maybe some other data, like bookkeeping data, reference counts, and so forth to track about a session. And so instead of returning an integer ID, now we return that pointer to the, to the, to the consumer, just like you would return a struct vnode uh, to be a handle to a vnode to things inside the kernel. And when something wants to operate on a vnode, it just gives the pointer right back. So now this was the same. You're just passing the pointer back to IPsec or Jelly, and they give the pointer right back. Um, and then on the other end, to kind of help the device driver interface, one of the changes Conrad made was to extend this structure to hold an additional pointer to the driver's kind of private structure that's allocated per session. So Conrad extended the routine that driver is used to register with OCF so that they now tell the OCF framework how big a size they want for their driver private structure. And this has other analogs in FreeBSD. For example, in Nubus, when you write a device driver, one of the parameters you put in your driver struct when you register with um, new bus is the size of your soft C. And then uh, the new bus framework, when it's going to attach your driver to an existing device, it pre-allocates your soft C as zero and hence a new query new bus for your soft C. When your de device goes away, new bus takes care of managing the life cycle and freeing the soft C for you. So the, the idea that Conrad was doing here is very similar to a soft C. Uh, the OCF framework pre-allocates the structure for you and before it invokes your hook to create a new session inside a device driver. Um, it pre-zeroes the structure that it gives to you, so you don't have to worry about it having data leaked into it. Um, and when your session is freed, it goes ahead and, and um, frees the structure and, and explicitly zeroes it as part of freeing the structure for you, since in this case, uh, you may have stored sensitive data and a driver structure for a crypto driver. Uh, Conrad added a new routine, crypto get driver session, that you can call inside your process callback <clears throat> or in your new session callback as well um, in your driver to get your access to this pointer directly. And so instead of having to do um, some kind of lookup, um, maybe order in or maybe a table if you've done it, but with under a lock, now you get to do this lockless order in lookup that's just kind of indirect in one pointer to get the next one. And it's much simpler to deal with than drivers. So the first thing that I worked on that kind of shipped in FreeBSD 13 um, was I changed how we describe configuring a session. So instead of having this linked list of kind of separate nodes for, for Cypher and auth, I defined a new flat structure. Um, it's called crypto session params. And it includes, um, first of all, an explicit mode. This was kind of new from before. Before you had to intuit what mode was requested based on the kind of combination of things in your linked list. Now it explicitly tells you, do you are you only doing encryption or you're only doing a hash um, or are you doing E to A um, or an AAD cipher? Um, it also still it can say compression because you still have that in OCF. Um, it includes things like which algorithms are being used. So, you know, if we're, if we're doing Cypher or E2A, what Cypher algorithm are we using? If we're doing a digest or E2A, what Mac algorithm are we going to use? Um, what links are we going to use for the keys for the given algorithms that are involved? And what links do we want for our Mac? Because in some cases, we don't want the full map. We want some kind of truncated version of the Mac. Our IPsec does that in certain cases. It also has a flags field. That I'll talk about more later. Uh, that could be used to add new optional features that not all drivers are required to support, but might be useful for some combinations of drivers and consumers to support. And if your session is going to use the same keys for all requests within the session, you can store those pointers to those keys in this session structure. Um, another change I made that's kind of related to this is I changed the way that OCF probes sessions. In particular, I added a new hook in the interface between uh, the crypto framework and crypto drivers uh, called crypto dev probe session. Previously, the way OCF and 11 worked is that when a driver registered with OCF, it would kind of make a call for every algorithm that supported. So it might say, I support ASCBC and I support GCM and I support uh, different variations of the SHA hash. And then OCF assumed that if whatever things you gave, uh, whatever things you listed, that you also supported combinations of them, like E to A. Um, and OCF at the time didn't have a way to fall back if a driver didn't like a session. 
So if you had a device driver and you supported CBC and a SHA hash, but for some reason you didn't support E to A, um, your only recourse as a device driver was to fail the session and that failure was propagated all the way back up to the consumer because OCF wouldn't fall back to some other driver, for example, a software driver to try to satisfy the request. Um, instead, in this model, we pass that session structure from the previous slide all the way down to the device driver and the device driver gets to look at the whole session. It can evaluate all the parameters, not just does it have algorithms I support, which is all OCF would check before, um, but does it have the key sizes I want or do, that I support? Um, do I support the kind of mode it's asking for? Um, all sorts of different things. Anything described in that structure, use a device driver, um, can evaluate. Um, and then the pro hook uh, doesn't just return kind of an error or zero. Similar to device proroutines in Nubus, the pro hook returns a kind of bidding value. And there's some predefined constants just like used with device proroutines in Nubus so that a device driver can kind of return its relative priority relative to other drivers. Uh, and just as in Nubus, at OCF now, it calls probe session on all the drivers that are registered to find the best candidate driver um, for a given session instead of just stopping with the first one that it finds and trying only that one. Um, so uh, one of the other things that we when I did when I added this is that previously, um, while OCF had some notion of what it would call software versus hardware drivers, um, but it lumped in uh, things like that were, that were still software and synchronous like ASNI as a hardware driver and they were treated the same priority as something that was a full-on coprocessor that could offload operations and not use CPU cycles. So instead, uh, what happens now is that there's actually different probe return values by default so that uh, kind of base software exists at one level and then accelerated software at, at a kind of middle tier and then things that are coprocessors at the kind of highest tier. And then there's gaps between those values, just so there are with the bus probe constants used in device probes, so that you can provide more nuanced control. So an example of this is that Netflix uses a set of routines developed by Intel from a library called ESA-L, and there's a, like a crypto sub-library of ESA-L to handle ASGCM. And so one of the things I did for Netflix is I wrote an, a simple OCF driver that wraps the ESA-L library, it's imports in security slash ESA-L. Um, and because that driver does ASGCM a little more efficiently, especially for the TLS use case than ASNI, if you have both drivers loaded in the kernel, uh, ESA-L returns a pro priority that's a slightly um, better priority than ASNI. So if you have that driver loaded, it will take priority over ASNI for GCM. So we talked a bit about changes made to the session side. Uh, now I'm going to talk about changes I made to the structure that describes an individual request when you're going to encrypt or decrypt a buffer itself. Um, so similar to the work that had been done in, in sessions, I uh, collapsed the linked list of descriptors down to make them just new members, inline members, so we have a flat structure to look at inside our device driver. So things like uh, the start and length of our AAD and our payload and our MAC regions inside the buffer are now just um, inline members of the structure. Uh, if you need to have a separate, if your IV is stored on the side, that's now part of the structure instead of a member of one of the descriptors. If you have keys that are specific to this request, those are also have been pulled up into the request structure. And then one other change I made uh, that I'll talk a little bit more in a second is um, I took the fields that had been used previously to describe a crypto buffer and I kind of moved them into a small separate helper structure to provide some abstraction, but that structure itself is still aggregated and stored inline inside the request structure. So I talked earlier about the kind of tri-state and how we managed IVs and nonces inside drivers before. So I, I took that out. Um, I took the, the, the case, I still allowed consumers to not have to specify a, a nonce and defer that to the framework, but that now happens up inside the framework itself. So by the time a driver gets a request, it either has an IV, it always has a valid IV in the request, it's either in the side buffer or it's in the data buffer, and it doesn't have to deal with generating those in the driver anymore. So the driver is just done in one place or the other. And the other thing I added was a little helper routine, crypto read IOV, um, that if a driver needs the IV locally, it's not just going to like have a coprocessor DMA directly from the buffer. I'm making you call this function and it'll read it from wherever it's stored and copy it into a provided buffer, usually something on the stack. Um, and with a combination of these two changes, uh, a bunch of boilerplate code that was like several tens of well, many, like 10, 15 lines in every single driver collapsed down to usually one line. 
So now I want to talk a little bit about uh, these crypto buffers, this kind of abstraction I wrapped around to better uh, describe the data buffers that we're going to perform operations on. So I made a new type, struct crypto buffer. Uh, and initially it mirrored what was already there in OCF and FreeBSD 11. It supported three types of backing store. The first would be a flat uh, buffering kernel memory, so just a single pointer length that was valid. Uh, the second use case is a, an IOVEX. You have a, an array of IOVEX, just like you would have with uh, like read V or write V, but kernel pointers instead. Uh, and then an MBUF that's an MBUF chain, so a pointer to the first chain in a packet. Um, but later, this has been extended since I did the work by Alan Summers. He added support for a backing store that consists of an array of pages. Um, and this is useful for unmapped IO and Jelly, uh, where you can get a disk request that just has an array of VM page T's without kernel virtual addresses. Um, and if you're using, um, if you're not using software crypto, then you never, you never have to map the data at all. Um, and even if you're using software crypto, you can just use the direct map on modern architectures and not have to deal with um, mapping and unmapping buffers and get the gains of unmapped IO even when you're doing the encryption with Jelly. One of the other things I added to kind of make the abstraction a little more complete, um, there, were, there were some existing routines that already knew how to copy data into and out of a, of a buffer, um, but they, the arguments they took were a bit bizarre. They took separate pieces of things out of the crypto request and I changed them to instead just take the crypto buffer so that the buffer itself became more opaque. Um, and then I added these separate little data structures called a cursor. And what a cursor does is a cursor, you can initialize it by saying, I want you to be initialized from some buffer. Um, and then you can basically use the cursor to walk the buffer in chunks of virtual address space. Um, so if the, if the buffer is just a single flat buffer, then you walk, then the first time you try to walk it or the first segment you get out of the cursor is the whole thing. Or if it's an IOVEC, um, you kind of walk each member of the IOVEC. Um, where it becomes a little more useful even is for things like um, when Alan added support for array of pages, this could just use a direct map and use the direct map pointer to map each page and then return that to the caller. So that um, when drivers were changed that were doing software, drivers in particular were changed to use cursors to iterate over stuff, um, they had to be changed once to use cursors, but then later when Alan added support for pages, the, the crypto soft code didn't actually have to change. Only the cursor implementation had to learn about this new buffer type. And then uh, to complement uh, the case for coprocessors that are doing DMA, I also added a bus DMA method that knows how to load a mapping and kind of give you your scattered gather list back for a given crypto buffer. So again, that means that a device driver is doing DMA, they call this method. They don't have to understand anymore what the different types are. They don't have to call a different bus DMA method for an MBUF versus a flat buffer versus a, an IOVAC. Instead, they just call the one method and everything's fine. And again, when Alan added um, array of pages, no device drivers had to be changed because it only required changes to this one bus DMA method. Um, in addition to kind of the changes to the data structures, I also made a couple of semantic changes uh, that I think were clear in FreeBSD 13. Um, in particular, uh, AD, AD, AD algorithms like ASGCM, they are now defined as having a single algorithm constant and they have a single key that's set. And that's the, the one key for both kind of parts of the algorithm, all parts of the algorithm. Uh, there's no longer separate constants to deal with. And you don't have to sanity check that the two halves are in sync. Um, I also changed drivers to do validation of the Mac for ETA inside drivers itself. Um, <clears throat> for hardware drivers, this mostly meant, for example, removing kind of hacks to kind of do what uh, OCF expected before. Um, and this also required some changes in IPsec to basically have it stop trying to do the validation and trust the result that got back from OCF directly. So one of the things I also ran into while I was working on porting drivers is that testing uh, crypto drivers, um, there wasn't really um, complete or adequate tests that worked well for at least for me when I was doing initial support. Um, so testing coverage was a bit uneven. So John Mark, when he had brought in ASGCM, he also brought in some other tests that run as part of Kia. He has a Python wrapper script that, that can talk to dev crypto. Um, and then it uses known answer tests that came from NIST that have a set of vectors for kind of known inputs and what you should get for outputs for uh, GCM and CBC as well as some other algorithms. And those were added in FreeBSD 11. Um, and those were helpful. Um, but they had a couple of limitations. Um, one is that it wasn't quite as easy to say, I want to run your test against 
only my driver and not all the drivers in the system uh, and kind of had some hard coded assumptions for what set of suite of algorithms were supported by different drivers. It can kind of auto discover uh, which ones were supported or not. Um, and also when you're, in my experience, when you're working on a driver, uh, it's really useful to have initially very simple kind of known answer tests that are, that are reproducible, meaning, or known answer style of test, I should say. Um, but things that are reproducible that you can easily do, because unlike debugging some other things, uh, if you get uh, a buffer offset wrong and you're working with a network packet, you can maybe, if you splat it in the wrong place into your inbuff, for example, you can kind of find, oh, I have an offset and my data is shifted by some amount, um, or I've corrupted something, I wrote something to the wrong kind of offset in a buffer, and you can find where the data is wrong and kind of intuit back to what you did wrong. Um, in my experience, when you're working with crypto, if you get some parameter wrong, you've got a flag or a bit wrong in the request you sent to your coprocessor driver, you just get garbage. <laughs> it's not always easy to figure out the origin of your garbage. Um, so having really simple ways to reproduce and to tweak things um, and, and see, and maybe sometimes you, you know exactly what the, the case you're doing and you can hex dump it at different stages as it tra traverses kind of your tree and maybe look exactly at how your driver um, generates the request that goes to the firmware on the, on the card to generate something, uh, that's really useful that you can kind of always set it reproducible and not just random data and it changes every time. Um, so, and, I, and I've also needed it for all the algorithms, not just the ones that were supported by the, the NIST tests that uh, John Mark had, had added. So I wrote a new tool. Um, it's not installed by default because it's really just kind of for in testing. And so it lives in tools, tools, crypto in the source tree, but it's called crypto check. It's kind of descended from a similar tool in that directory called crypto test, um, except that I found that crypto test is more about doing performance benchmarks than necessarily correctness benchmarks, which is what I was after. Um, so crypto check is a, is a little tool. And the way it works is um, for a given operation that it's going to test, it generates a random buffer and a key and a nonce, but it doesn't call the function that seeds the random number generator. So it always generates the same random buffer, key and not. So that makes it reproducible, but you're not just encrypting, say, zeros. You are kind of encrypting random, random-ish data every time. Um, and then once it's generated those inputs for a given test that it's going to use, it first sends the inputs through OpenSSL's software implementation of whatever um, cipher or authentication algorithm or kind of com combined mode that we're validating. And it uses OpenSSL as a gold standard. And so it uses that to generate what the output that it thinks it should expect. Then for the driver that you've selected that you've test, tested based on a command line argument, it sends a request to OCF. And then it compares the two results and tells you kind of where you went wrong. At least, at least it can tell you, for example, did you encrypt the data right, but you got the Mac wrong um, at kind of a that level granularity. And it kind of gives you hex dumps of where things are different, where they go wrong. Um, and uh, one of the things this tool can do is it can you can give it um, a, like different sizes that you want to use for both the AAD region and for buffers and for and for uh, ciphers that use different key sizes. There's ways to test the different key sizes. Um, and later I've even added extensions for some ciphers can take different not sizes, and there's ways to request a different uh, not size for things like uh, AESCCM. And it also has some kind of modes where it'll test a variety of different combinations of sizes of AAD and buffer. Um, and that's been useful uh, in my experience going forward to be able to check for regressions and find things when I'm kind of adding new features to OCF. So what are some things that have been added um, after it's kind of this first round of changes? What are some things that happened later that were kind of able to build on what was there? And in particular, um, the first set of things I'll talk about are, are new extensions to sessions. And these are all represented by new flags. So I mentioned earlier that that session parameter structure I added had a flag struct. Initially, the flags were always zero. But when I converted all the drivers over to use uh, the probe session hook with this new structure, I made them all reject any session that had a flag they didn't know about. So in particular, they all started off with saying the flags were not zero, then I reject this session. I failed to probe it. So we want to add a new feature that's kind of optional then we can reserve a new bit or a new flag in this flags field um, and set it and the existing drivers will all fail the thing. Um, so drivers can choose whether or not they're going to support a given new feature by checking, by modifying their probe routines to now validate, hey, yeah, I do support this new feature once the driver has been updated. So we don't have to change all drivers at once to add something. We can only change drivers that matter because in some use cases, not all drivers care about them. Um, the one thing that is required is there's a kind of software fallback driver, CryptoSoft, that's kind of, it has to implement everything. Uh, so it implements all the algorithms, for example, that, that are supported. 
so when we do add a new feature, you do need to support it in CryptoSoft so that a consumer such as Jelly or IPsec that wants to start using a new feature can know that it's going to work. There's going to be some driver available that does it. Um, but harder drivers can jump in if they support it as well or accelerated software. So the first extension I added was support for separate input and output buffers. And this is used by KTLS. Uh, another extension I added was support for having the AAD buffer on the side, which is also used by K2LS sessions. And that's supported by both of these, I think are supported by most drivers in the tree at this point. Another feature that was added uh, more recently by Semihath is support for something called an extended sequence number and it's used in IPsec. Now, when you have an ESN, uh, it's not passed on the wire. It's actually something that is just fed into the auth half. So uh, it's kind of similar to the way that uh, for TLS, some of the AAD data that's authenticated only uh, is not actually all passed on the wire. So uh, for GCM, the ability to have a separate AAD buffer meant that you could already support ESN using that one feature alone. But for some of the other Cypher suites that IPsec used, uh, that approach didn't quite work. And so IPsec added a new feature for use with like non-AAD ciphers um, that reserves a little field of crypto structure and stores the ESN there that can be fed into the Mac at the right place. We've also added new ciphers into the tree since uh, the framework changes. And I, I feel like it was a little easier to add the ciphers due to some of the changes that have been made. That have been made. Uh, the first one that was added, uh, not by myself, I should declare right on this slide, was support for AES CCM, which is an a, another AE80 cipher, kind of similar to GCM, but a little different. It uses a, a different, um, it uses a different kind of auth side than GCM uses. And it's used by ZFS for ZFS's data set encryption. Um, we've also since added support for ChaCha20 and Poly1305, which is a combination of ChaCha20, which is a stream cipher with the Poly1305, which is a, uh, a, a hash or digest, kind of like SHA, but a little different. Um, and there's a defined combination of those two as an A80 cipher um, that's used both for TLS and also used in WireGuard. Um, and we've also added um, another variant of that called X ChaCha20 Poly1305 that's also used in WireGuard negotiation. But in addition to adding things such as ciphers or extensions, I also took the opportunity to look at uh, OCF and see if there are things that we could remove or things that were kind of um, no longer quite as useful or perhaps things that were deprecated. So one of the first things I removed was support for, or actually it's not the first, but it's one that comes to mind, um, was support for asymmetric cryptography, uh, the things like uh, Chinese remainder theorem and some other kind of math operations on uh, big numbers. And that was removed in FreeBSD 14. So it hasn't shipped yet, but it's in head or main rather, it's gone. Um, so modern OpenSSL doesn't use this. I already talked about that, that when OpenSSL rewrote its engine for dev crypto, um, it removed support for this. So there is an existing software that I know of in the wild that actually will even try to use this if, it's, if, if we did still keep it. It's also very undocumented. Um, and to go along with undocumented, we also didn't really have good use uh, good test cases for it either that existed. And it wasn't easy to figure out how to write test cases because it wasn't really well documented. Um, and one reason in particular that that was true was there was no software fallback for this. So there wasn't, and it, and it wouldn't make sense to have one in the kernel, quite frankly, since there was no kernel use case for doing these operations. So it wasn't easy to figure out. There wasn't like a reference case to look at to understand what are these operations really supposed to do so you can then even go back and try to fix the documentation and then go back and write tests. Um, we also had very limited driver support in the tree. I think when I last looked, or the last time I looked before it was removed, we had two drivers in the tree that supported it. One of them was for a specific MIPS SOC and we've removed, we've since removed MIPS entirely from FreeBSD 14. So we were gonna be down to one driver anyway. Um, so it just really wasn't a lot of support and it didn't really warrant keeping it around. Um, for what the kind of stuff it added and a bit extra maintenance in it and complexity instead of OCF. Um, another thing that got removed uh, is that the industry has progressed. We've learned more about ciphers over time. Um, now it's pretty typical that you want to be using an AAD cipher like ASGCM for most things. Um, older ciphers have, they're, they're, they're either not as cryptographically strong and they've been deprecated by RFCs. So many of those that were deprecated by RFCs in particular have been removed, like they're no longer a good idea to be using in IPsec unless you really have to. Um, so things like DES or triple DES, 
um, or using MD5 for your HMAC, which you really probably don't want to be doing um, in, in, in modern times. So then I guess the question to really to evaluate kind of this work um, is, is it better? And I have my own biased opinion, um, but I think you can, there are other, if other people who worked in this space will probably willing to share their opinions as well, for better or for worse. Um, I feel like we have less duplicated code and drivers now uh, that I've been able to hoist things that were copy pasted a bunch of times up out of drivers and into other places where they're more centralized. I feel like we also have less busy work in drivers. Um, the thing with dealing with linked lists and trying to intuit, for example, what mode we're in um, or other things that you had to just kind of duplicate across drivers all over the place. Um, so the integer IDs instead of getting be able to get your driver session pointer directly. Um, OCF has improved the point uh, that, that in Netflix's testing, it, it performed um, on par with their existing homegrown interface that they had. So now that support for that, that different interface has been removed and KTLS now always uses OCF if it's not using um, some kind of more abstract NIC offload. And I think another kind of thing that makes it better is that other developers have been able to uh, work with the code and add extensions on top of it. Um, so it's not so obtuse, I guess, that only I can understand it for lack of a better way of saying it. Uh, so for example, I mentioned that Alan had added support for unmapped IO to Jelly by adding a new buffer type to uh, crypto buffers and the cursors that go along with that. Um, and Sumi Half added support for IPsec ESN. Um, I also, there's some other patches that haven't emerged yet. For example, um, I think there's a patch out there that adds ChaCha20 to IPsec um, using the stuff that's been added. So what are some things we could do in the future that I think would help us going forward? Um, one is there's still some, uh, interesting behavior around the way that we schedule requests, um, what I call async requests, but in particular requests that are going to a software driver versus a coprocessor. Uh, Mark Johnston has done some work here to make this a little clearer, but the semantics are still a bit odd. For example, we actually have two different thread pools, depending on kind of uh, what used to be a flag, but is now what function you call. Requests can get routed either to a single K thread or to a K thread or to a, a process that has kind of per CPU threads. We probably should collapse that back down to be, we really only probably need one of those. Uh, I would like to move compression completely out of OCF. It's really an odd duck. It doesn't really fit the same way and that compression needs to resize buffers. Uh, whereas the existing Cypher things we do don't really resize buffers aside from adding or removing a Mac. Uh, and it just doesn't really fit well. It's also a very limited use case. The only use case we have is for IPCOM, um, which only uses one algorithm via a software driver, which is Zlib. Um, part of the reason I hesitate on doing this earlier is that when I have tried to test IPCOM, it doesn't work today. And so it's hard to make sure that I don't regress it further if I can't get it to work at all. Another topic that I think uh, would be really useful is to kind of split the notion of consumer sessions for things like IPsec or Jelly or TLS from driver sessions that belong to device drivers. And in particular to allow us to mux them so we can have multiple driver sessions, software or hardware or some combination backing a given consumer session. Uh, there are a couple of different use cases for this. One is failover in case, for example, a device driver has a hardware failure or it's something that can be ejected and goes away that your consumer can continue running just fine. OCF has some limited support for failover, but it's kind of janky. Um, it requires you to notice that the session on a given object has been, or a given request has been replaced, and then you're supposed to update your saved copy of the session somewhere else in your consumer, and that's just kind of wonky. Um, well, there's some other use cases. For example, um, some coprocessor drivers might not support certain edge case uh, uh, requests, requests. And, it would be convenient if they had a nice clean way to say, hey, can you let software do this request for me instead because I don't support it. And, and if we had a, a, a kind of mux, they could fail with a certain error node value and the framework could just kick it over to a software session um, and maybe lazily allocate the software session on demand. You might also imagine that for some cases, you might want to distribute requests across multiple backends. Um, some sessions have a lot of traffic associated with them. For example, on IPsec, a single SA uses a single session and that can cover multiple connections across different sockets, unlike say TLS, where every socket has its own uh, session. And so it might be nice if you have multiple uh, crypto engines lying around that you could kind of round robin request among different engines if you're able to do a MUX. Um, another use case 
um, and that kind of in this that comes to mind is uh, if you're dealing with a very small request, there, there's a certain amount of overhead that is required to kind of set up a coprocessor to do a crypto request. You've got to kind of write the firmware request. You've got to set it up so that it can then turn around and DMA the request and process it and DMA it back. Um, and that overhead can be pretty non-trivial for really small buffers. And so you, there may be use cases, for example, in TLS, where you have a mix of some small records and some larger records um, that you're encrypting or decrypting, or the same with IPsec packets. And you may want to have some kind of uh, maybe something that can be tuned or configured per session where they can kind of set a cutoff where small requests go to a software session, but larger requests go off to a coprocessor available. So uh, this is kind of what I had to talk about today. I wanted to thank uh, Chelsea on Communications and Netflix because they sponsored much of my work on this. Um, one of the drivers I worked on for was for Chelsea. And so a lot of the early work I did to improve the framework was about having um, Chelsea's driver work more efficiently. Um, and then uh, especially the work result revolved, uh, involved making OCF more efficient for the kernel TLS offload was sponsored by Netflix. So now I'm going to ask if there are any questions. And I got to go find my other laptop to go find my IRC. Okay, so I see some questions on IRC that I'll try to answer going forward. Um, first, um, someone has asked, uh, is Quick Assist via the QAT driver going to be usable in OCF? So um, Mark Johnson did a port of the Quick Assist driver from NetBSD and, okay. Uh, so Mark Johnson did a port of the Quick Assist driver from NetBSD to FreeBSD and that driver does include support for OCF um, and he's tested it using uh, KTLS, I believe, and also uh, ZFS for encryption. Uh, it's also true that um, Intel has a driver for Quick Assist, and they are working. It's, there's currently an open review in Fabricator where they're going to import uh, their driver, I think, to, re to replace the earlier driver, and it will also include OCF bindings to support um, open uh, in kernel use cases. <laughs> Is crypto check an actual case of the XKCD? No, it does not quite return four every time. It's a little more than that. Um, and also you can get some variation uh, because if you, you can run crypto check in a mode where you ask it to perform multiple requests and depending on kind of the set of requests you ask, you actually can get different results. But for the given inputs and, and set of algorithms and sizes you request, you will get the same results every time. So someone has asked, um, when you do an SADB register response, they indicate it supports an algorithm. So I guess this is about um, IPsec. There's a guarantee the algorithm will work with IPsec either using hardware acceleration or software drivers. Yes, if we return okay from uh, the IOCTL saying that yes, we support the algorithm, that means that we've been able to find a session. That's part of what IPsec will do is try to actually create the, the, the relevant session and if it finds a session that it works, then it, only if it returns success, that means they found a session that's going to work. Do we corner you um, if we have patches for OCF is what someone asked. Um, no, you can probably just put them in Fabricator and tag me on the review. I think I've been able to review most of the changes, um, the recent changes that have gone into OCF. I think that's all the questions I have for now. And I think I also used up my entire hour time slot. Um, so I'll wait a couple more minutes for questions, but thank you for watching and hopefully this was a useful talk.